My name is Matthias Costa. I'm one of the cerebrovascular fellows here at the Seattle Science Foundation and Swedish Neurosciences Institute. I want to thank Dr. McDougall for joining us. Today we have a very, very special speaker, Professor René Chapeau from Germany. Professor Chapeau is the, is the head of the endovascular therapy and neuroradiology at the Krupp Krakenhaus, as in Germany. Uh, he He's known for being very, very creative and having developed numerous techniques in our field. Just to name a few of them, he developed uh, techniques in the treatment of aneurysms like the kissing balloon technique, T and a half T stenting, stent extraction technique. In the field of dural fistula, he developed the venous remodeling technique. In stroke, he has the first reported case of thrombectomy in 1999 and developed uh, and also developed a stent retriever in 2003. In the field of ADMs, he developed the pressure cooker technique and shipping technique, and also <clears throat> the venous AVM embolization techniques. Uh, there are, of course, many more things to say about Professor Chapeau. He's very, a very published author, but I don't want to take his time. So, Professor, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and I give you time for your presentation. Okay, hello. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. I guess it must be very early for you. It's not the case for me. It's not early at all. <laughs> so we already through most of our procedure of the day. And now um, I'm very happy to share some thoughts on the treatment of AVMs because I think that uh, we're not really happy with what has been going on with embolization of AVMs. I think the expectation was very high and if we look where we are today, the cure rate is not really as good as we would wish. How many AVMs, how often can we cure an AVM? By far not as much as we would like to. <laughs> and if we see the role of AVM, of AVM embolization is rather decreasing with time, because of course some arteries do not remain accessible. And whenever we try to force and to inject forcefully, we increase the ischemic risk. So um, transvenous embolization seems to be something which uh, must not be understood as uh, everything which is too difficult by the artery is going to be venous, but it's another way to look at the problem. And in fact, it opens a lot of perspectives. Uh, so why is it possible to go by the vein? Because if it's possible to push embolic agent from arteries to the veins, then it's possible also to push it from the veins to the arteries. And there are those abnormal connections. Another very important reason why to do so is that in numerous cases, uh, we just cannot access to the shunts. And if we would try, we would create a lot of ischemia. This would be the price to pay. And the vein is just much better accessible. And interesting is usually surgery and and embolization are somehow in competition and the problems are the same for both techniques. And this is one of the rare situations where a deep vein, which is a major issue with open surgery, appears to be an advantage for, for embolization. So just an example of this AVM here, that's not so large, left frontal, we thought should be uh, possible to cure it, and then we reduced it a lot up to a point uh, where Renee, I, I think your slides are not advancing, maybe, or maybe it's just mine. Uh, oh, there we go. Thank you. There you go. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, we went from this initial situation to that, and well, at this point, we're quite frustrated that we could not bring it to an end. Uh, which, of course, may be done by surgery here, may be done by radiosurgery, but why just can't we do it by embolization? And if you look precisely, um, here on the lateral view, you see those transmedular arteries. I'll make a zoom out of it. You see here, those little arteries, definitely they are not accessible. So this is lateral view. If we look at it on AP, we see that here, these are all the transmedullary arteries, and there are a bunch of them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, but at least 10, and none of them is properly accessible. 
So you know that you won't be able to get it. But I go back, look at the vein. The vein is quite straight. And the more your arterial in the course of the suprasagittal sinus, the better the vein accessible. Starting from the midline, there's a U-turn, which is really difficult, but here it's okay. And getting access to this vein was not an issue. And once you're in the vein here, you can embolize. You can see that you can push the embolic agent retrogradely from the artery, from the veins to the arteries, and occlude the AVM. But not only that, you occluded the AVM. You don't. You do not kill the brain, which is here. You see that this part of cortex is still present, and it's um, <laughs> certainly functional here. So, um, transvenous embolization is quite often a better access. That still is a major paradox why um, we wonder whether we should do it or not, because we all know that whenever we occlude the draining vein, hemorrhage can occur, not can, but will occur. So are we allowed to occlude the vein? The principle of embolization says, no, don't occlude the vein, otherwise the ABM will bleed. But on the other hand, as long as the vein is not occluded, the AVM will not be cured. So is this a paradox? Sounds like a paradox, but in fact, no. It just means that whenever the vein is occluded, then you must be sure that all of the shunts will be occluded. Both must work in parallel. So how to be sure when you start to get vein to occlude the AVM entirely. Well, let's take some simple things. The so smaller the AVM, the less shunts are present, less AV shunts, and then the safer it is. If we change it, if you've got a large AVM with a lot of vessels, with a lot of shunts, the chance to be able to push the amolic agents within all shunts and all vessels is certainly not that high. And then the chance to get a problem is certainly higher. That's why um, everything which is large is much more dangerous. And that's why staging is important. But again, back to the point how to be sure, small IVM is better. Um, another point is when you have a smaller IVM, the vein is smaller, the chance to push your amolic agent against the flow will be higher in a very large vein, before you get a plug allowing to push the embolic agents against flow is much more difficult. But of course, <laughs> the price for this is if the vein is small, the navigation is gonna be more difficult. So you cannot win um, on every aspect. So how to make a large AVM having small outflow veins? Well, by starting by doing transarterial embolization, which is being done in most of these patients. But now I'm going to show you another example why, uh, why it's open, why it's important to open our minds, which is this here. That's a patient, he bled, the AVM is fed by the lenticular striate artery. But if you look in detail, there's not only one, but there are one, two, three, four, five, maybe six arteries and one vein, which is this one. How many arteries are accessible? I would say none, <laughs> but with a lot of efforts, you may use a balloon here. If you look here, it's the MCA bifurcation. Um, the origin of this big one here is there. So to put here a microcatheter, the only that navigates is a magic. To do so, we had to place a balloon. Here is this balloon, which was in the super division branch. And this way we could progressively navigate with a lot of efforts and probably one hour. Let's look at the time. Here it's nine o'clock, here it's 10. So it took indeed one hour to have the microcatheter in place. Here's a tip of the magic. And if you look at selective injection, we're indeed just at the origin of the vein. So at this stage, the chance for us to obtain a significant reduction of the AVM is very high. The point is, do we want a reduction or a cure? And the answer is self-explaining, we want a cure. How can we be sure that if we inject a liquid embolic, we're gonna occlude everything? 
Uh, this is not a micro character which is compatible with Onyx. So we cannot use a push and pluck technique here, which otherwise would have been possible. So if we inject some NBCA, the behavior of the liquid embolic is not so much predictable, but still somehow predictable. In other words, some will go inside the vein, some will go backwards. So if you have something in the vein, occluding the vein without having all the little arteries occluded, this AVM will bleed, which is the reason why it may be considered to use the access through the straight sinus and deep vein to place a microcatheter here. This access was indeed really much more easier than the artery and having a microcatheter here in the vein close to the microcatheter and the artery took much less time and was definitely, was definitely much less difficult. Goal of this catheter here is just security. I don't know whether I need it, but in case of doubt, I may need it. Then uh, even a cord is injected in the vein to prevent some liquid embolic agents. These are the Bernstein liquid coils that are not available anymore, unfortunately. So we ask bulks to produce the same one. So now they are not liquid, they are fluid coils, but it's the same thing, of course. And those coils can be injected in the vein to prevent distal migration of liquid embolic. And then you inject your glue, you inject here the highest, uh, quite diluted, um, and BCA, which first goes to the vein, is stopped by the coil, goes backwards, and then when it starts to go backwards alongside the microcatheter, then you have to retrieve it, otherwise it's going to get blocked. So at this stage, probably most of the ABM is done, but if you look at the angel, it's not completely done, and this lenticulostriate is still present. So there is a bit of remaining arterial flow. Uh, what is the consequence of this? I don't know. It may thrombose if you're lucky. It may bleed if you're not lucky. Uh, if the catheter wouldn't have been in the vein, you could not do anything. To have the catheter remaining in the vein allowed to inject one drop of onyx that occluded the vein and the distal part of the artery and cure the AVM. So if you consider this patient here, what is safer to use the vein and not the vein? I think the answer is self-explaining. Because we had a catheter in the vein, we could it bring we could bring it to a cure. And I think that's the way we should think. Um, is it dangerous to navigate through the vein? It's an additional effort. But on the other hand, it opens perspectives and gives you the ability to do something that otherwise you could not do. And whenever you already started to embolize and the liquid embolic is going somewhere where you don't want, at this stage, it may be too late to be able to get further access to the vein. And that's why this is probably to be done at the beginning. So here, definitely, the venous access was an additional security. Um, here, I just wanted to show you, I was not the one who first did the transvenous. I think this is uh, Stefan Udak in Hungary. Um, I still started about 20 years ago, and that was a patient I treated. She bled, uh, it was her ninth bleeding. The AVM is located underneath the splenium. She had had three times radio surgery, and I mean, it's just not accessible. You see the arteries also are not accessible, but the vein is simple. And you even see this venous aneurysm and navigating through the vein here at that time, still putting a cast in the artery to reduce flow, enabled at some point to push the liquid embolic back side to the AVM and to cure the patient. But this is rather hard today, a situation where we would use it. And these indications are enlarging all the time, which is here in the ambient cistern around the PCA. And this seems quite simple because it's small, but when you look selectively, here's a microcatheter in the PCA, so there's not a single artery which is accessible. There is no feeder. All those branches are all passant feeders, but it all drains through a vein that you can see here, this vein there. 
And that's why we took the vein, injected retrogradly, as you see here, which cured the ABM and kept the PCA open. So um, here, uh, what is this? Okay, here's the uh, controls. Um, so definitely access to the shunts is in many patients um, much better by the vein, but it does not mean that no arterial microcatheterization has to be done. But to be able to see the vein is much more difficult than to look at an artery where you are with a microcatheter. In other words, if you want to be able to selectively look at the vein that you want to access to, you need to have a microcaster placed in the arteries to precisely understand the arterial anatomy and to have an injection which is um, which shows mostly this vein and not all the veins of the brain. So in each patient for transvenous embolization, selective arterial access is always mandatory to achieve a selective roadmap to know whether you can stop or whether you have to maintain the transvenous embolization, this is probably the second point is probably even more important than the first one, because one question which is always a big concern is to know when to stop embolization. And in fact, whenever you do an all over in angiogram, if you go on by transarterial embolization, it's quite simple. Whenever you see the vein, you see that the AVM is not done. If you proceed by the vein, whenever you occlude the vein, then you have no vein that you can see anymore. And it becomes very difficult to determine whether the whole AVM has been filled with embolic agent or not. But by while doing a selective injection of the feeders, you may see if the feeder still goes to the AVM or stops before. I will show later on example. So this is very important point to determine whether you can continue or stop the transvenous embolization. And last point, uh, you need a safety in case of problem. Imagine the AVM starts to bleed by the vein. Um, how to prevent that the AVM continues to bleed? And even it's luckily a rare situation. There are a few situations where we are very happy to have a catheter in the artery to be able to occlude more in the arteries than expected, but still be able to control the situation. So, um, now what is this? I don't know, my screen is strange. I'll try to go back. What happened? Okay, I go like this again. Another point by uh, transverse symbolization is how much veins can be occluded. And this is something which is um, not clear because sometimes said it's the vein of drainage of the AVM, you just can occlude it. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows how much of vein you can really sacrifice or not? And um, so probably the less we occlude the vein, the better it is. But one point which is more probably the most important here is if you cannot further inject within the AVM because you got a reflux, it is a problem. In a transarterial embolization, having a limitation of further injection by reflux has mostly as consequence that embolization is stopped. In transvenous embolization, it's not the reflux that can decide whether the AVM has been filled or not. This is something that the operator has to determine himself. And this is why we applied the pressure cut technique to the veins. We published this also not so long time ago, which is a way to say that we control the lengths um, by creating a plug which won't be a plug made of, made of glue. So if this is a scheme of a Navy M, which I will also explain why it's like this, we bring in two microcatheters with detachable tips. So in Europe, we have Sonic, but in and Apollo, you in US, Apollo is available. And then one plug is made out of coils, 
but of course coils do not prevent the flow to pass because the coils don't induce immediate thrombosis. So once the coil is in place, if you start to inject RDX, some will go to the coils. And at some point, it will go uh, back to the AVM. And at some point, when you start to have reflux again, then NBCA, high concentrated glue is injected to create a plug which is strong enough so that the operator can decide whether it continues and maintains or not until all the shunts are accessed. And this is in the hypothesis that the nidus of an AVM looks like this. But how do we know how a nidus looks like? And uh, it's interesting to see that today we don't have a good answer to this question. Just look at all books of uh, whatever specialty, neurosurgery, neuroradiology, or whatever. If you look at an AVM, here is an iris. And the iris shows arteries that are red, veins that are blue, but this is before and around, but inside here. You just have vessels of a um, strange color. <laughs> so you mix the colors, but this here doesn't explain how the vessels are connected. And whatever scheme you look at, you never have an explanation because there is, up to now, no explanation to tell us how this is. There is no. Here you have a vessel which is red, and this becomes blue, but this picture does not explain how it is. And I would even say, <laughs> So the word ninus is a characteristic of an AVM, but it's also a very elegant way to hide our ignorance, just because we don't really know what is inside. And unfortunately, since embolization are going on since more than 40 years, we know that partial embolization does not solve the problem. If part of the AVM is treated, it may look like this. Your tree, and I often compare AVMs to trees. Your tree will have a hole inside, but this does not show how the structures are inside here. So, um, to get forward, what do we understand by the arteries? Um, when we started to do um, what I call pressure cooker, which was initially intended to have a reflux of onyx applied to the arteries so that we use a combination of two microcatheters, one to create a plug out of injectable coils and glue, and one to inject onyx beyond. So the goal was to be able to inject as much as possible. But this um, showed us some pictures where we were very surprised. And let me show you this AVM. Uh, where we first treated the temporal part, whether it's this venous aneurysm, so a microcatheter is in place. And what do we see here? Unfortunately, nothing, because there's so much dilution of contrast agent that we see that the vein is here, but this would be considered as a macro shunt, as a high flow shunt, so that high concentrated liquid embolic agent would be injected. You may see that there are here two catheters. We made a plug. And then once the plug was done, we injected beyond. And this is the same position of the catheter. You see the plug is here, here are coils. Here is concentrated is to acryl. Um, the coils are there so that the acrylic glue remains stuck in the coil so that the microcatheter is still patent to be able to inject onyx. And this is the same injection than this one here. And now you suddenly understand that this, which is totally not understandable, becomes quite simple. You have one, two, three arteries arriving in one vein. And we can even look at it here. It's quite clear this is the vein. Here are the three arteries. We can even make a drawing out of it. And here are our three arteries and the vein. So this is one point that enables to see more, but definitely the best way to understand an AVM is when injecting by the veins. But from the previous patient here, I would say AVMs are just made out of arteries and veins. It's not surprising, of course, there are arteries and veins, but there is nothing else. 
Now, we would even say the nidus is mainly made of veins. And this is here a patient where um, had a bleeding in the brain stem, in the mesencephalon, so terrible prognosis. Uh, it's not dispersion artery that feeds it, but the feeder comes from here, from a perforator. And we understand an AVM as usual, which is to say that here are too many vessels, and here's the outflow vein reaching the current sinus. So a selective view shows a bit more, but not so much. We can look at a rotational angiogram, which is here, that shows, well, that shows the anatomy of the vein. This is okay. You see how the vein is. You see quite well. You see that it's very accessible, but you don't understand the shunts. And now that we went through the cover and the sinus, getting access to this vein, by the way, if you navigate through the cover and the sinus, it's always a pain. You can consider that you need about one hour to go from the cover and the sinus to the vein joining there, because there is a filter mechanism that makes it more difficult. Well, tip of the microcatheter is now in the vein, and this is now the injection of liquid embolic in the vein. So... I have this going on and you may see the vein. Hold on, I'm gonna take this apart here. And I will have um, a change here, the injection. I hope that you can see it. This is the main vein and arriving in these main veins are what I call primary veins alongside all over. And if you follow the injection here, you definitely see there is a main trunk and there are primary veins arriving in this main trunk. And the more you fill AVMs by the vein, the more you will see that you have a very similar appearance for most AVMs. So that I would say the scheme that you show is what I would generalize to all AVMs. All AVMs are mainly based on one major principal outflow vein. And it's not because you see a lot of veins around the AVM that there are more inside. This vein is being fed by several primary veins and around are a bunch of arteries. So we can make a nice drawing out of this. Um, but this is the basic principle statement from me for the angular architecture of all AVM that this is a venous segmentation with different veins coming together. And I think that the comparison with a tree, something which is very relevant, consider that all branches of uh, the tree are veins and, and all leaves around are the little arteries. There is not more than this. But because there are so many, we're not able to see it properly. So um, another thing that helps a lot to understand um, is to look at the MPRs. So if you have this AVM, for instance, you can make a rotational angiogram. When you see a rotational angiogram, the volume rendering image, you don't see inside, so it's of quite poor value. But if you play with this here, here you may see that uh, you have... Um, well, you may differentiate where veins and arteries are, but it's not so obvious to see. Uh, we've been using our cement system to um, um, make additions of 3Ds and giving a different color code. This is what I call 6D. And in fact, it's available on all cement systems since, uh, <laughs> since many years, but we just did not think of doing this. And by giving a different color, it gives a very deep understanding of what's going on. So here is this AVM, which is fed by um, the MCA and the ACA. We can look at it again, okay? And here we can see that by filling the left side, we only see the ACA. So if we do a rotational angiogram on the right side, here I added a balloon, in the ACA to be sure that we don't we see only the MCA. And then if you do another rotational angiogram, this time on the left ICA, keeping the balloon here, 
then we will have uh, two different data sets. And if we fuse with a different color, we're gonna obtain this here, where orange is the ACA, blue is the MCA. And here, if we scroll, we see that the vein is a mixture of both colors. So we see this greenish color here. And here we can precisely see what part of the AVM is given by which artery. Here, for instance, transmedular artery in blue. Here we see the connection between the arteries uh, inside the AVM. And this is something that appears to be extremely helpful. So I would even say if we compare 3D and 6D, the fact to have different colors is as if you would change from black and white TV to color TV. It gives another dimension, which is extremely helpful. And um, I would show an example. I think an example is the best way to understand. And we take a very simple example of this AVM, which is here, which is this small temporal AVM, but medial located. And if you look here, does not seem so complicated. The vein is to be seen. So we continue now with a rotational angiogram where the AVM is to be seen. And once the rotational angiogram is being done, we look at the AVM by selective catheterization of all arteries. And now, we should see that one microcatheter reached here the shunts. I mean, reached one feeder, was selective in one feeder, which enables to see here's the shunts and then the outflow vein. Same thing here on the lateral view. We're selectively inside the feeder, not so close to it, seeing the shunts and seeing the vein. Question, do we have the whole AVM? It's not easy to see. And of course, if I show you only one feeder, you don't have the answer. But if you do another rotational angiogram on through the microcatheter, and if you fuse the vision from the microcatheter within the whole AVM, you will obtain this here, which is uh, blue is the ICA, orange is the microcatheter. And whenever we scroll through the pictures, we can follow the microcatheter, we can see the shunts, but we see also that there is one compartment that we missed, which is also existing. That's important. This means that whenever we're going to embolize by the artery, we're not allowed to occlude the veins because there is something else getting inside this AVM. But this is here quite well visible. And here I go back and forth you, um, I mean, probably you need to scroll several times through these runs, but you should be able to see that this is one vein and what we had before is another vein. This is one vein, here is another vein, both joining. So if you scroll several times through all those pictures, you're able to see all this. You can see it also in another way, of course, by making a selective injection through a microcatheter, making simultaneous injections to the guiding, and this show you the part which is was in blue that was not selectively visible, visible. But don't do this every day. So um, now that we understood that there is another feeder, we can search for the second feeder. And this is here the run where we see two microcatheters injecting, injecting two parts. This is feeder number two. And I continue, this is feeder number one, okay? Number two and number one. Same thing here on the lateral view. We start with this one, number two, and then number one. Um, injection of number two shows that there is some brain also. If you force injection by here, some brain will be damaged and that's not the possibility to embolize from this artery. That's why we chose to go by the vein, which I should be able to show you here. This is access when placing um, 
uh, guiding catheter in this vein of Labé. For this, we quite often use a balloon just to take over the intimal folds to be able then to push our seven French Fubuki guiding catheter selectively inside the vein of Labé, as you can see here. And once this is being done, dual injection shows both compartments. And you may see probably on this picture B, one vein here and one vein there. Here are two veins. And that's why one catheter is brought within each vein to be able to occlude selectively the corresponding shunts. The third one being here to create the plug. So one is in one vein, second one in the other vein. Third catheter is brought here to make the plug. Here we see one, we see the second one, third one is still not in place. And then we can do embolization by both veins. This is the first injection here on one side showing the occlusion of compartment fed by microcatheter number two. However, the microcatheter in the artery still shows that one artery is creeping getting progressively up to the AVM. The fact that some arteries remaining is a point that makes say that embolization should be maintained and embolization is maintained up to the point where, um, let's go further, where whenever further embolization is being made, you don't see this artery. So similarly, the second compartment was treated so that here, because of these 60 analyses, you can understand both veins, you can understand where to place the microcatheters and um, treat accordingly by embocure these patients. Um, I'm going to skip this one because it's a bit long. And I want to go now to the point here. Because of this evolution, uh, today there are patients that we treat exclusively by transvenous embolization, but in a stage way, in different steps. And here is this 10-year-old boy. The AVM is unruptured. Um, but the patient has, I mean, seizures. Is it enough to treat or not? Um, we uh, patient agreed and was willing for treatment to be done. Here is this AVM. I mean, it's uh, a little anterior, but partially involved in the central sulcus. This is the left MCA. And here is the ACA, which is better fed from the other side. And on a similar way than what we did before, Exploring by 6D means that you obtain this kind of imaging where I'm trying to scroll through the pictures. The MCA is orange. And soon we're going to see here the main outflow vein within the AVM. You see all the shunts that are coming from the MCA, but you see also all the compartments that are coming from the ACA. And by scrolling here, you may see this, which is a primary vein joining the main vein. And this primary vein is a potential, is potentially accessible with a microcatheter. So once this one here is being seen, uh, Arterial exploration is achieved with the microcatheters through all the different feeders until you see this image, which looks very much like the image that we saw before. So this may be the primary vein that we're supposing uh, willing to be accessed to. The only thing, how can we be sure that this is the same? Then we do again a 6D. And by doing a new 6D, we obtain this picture, this time by selective injection of this compartment and of this vein. And if we compare this picture to the last one, definitely we hit the good vein. So to see selectively the vein, we must explore all arteries. 
not only looking at the arteries, but also looking at which vein is being used as a drainage by the feeder. And once this vein is being found, then you must find a way to put two microcatheters inside the vein, create a plug, and inject, this is the NPCA in this vein, and then inject retrogradly in order to have this compartment occluded. This is first transvenous embolization. And as second step, second step was then to get access to this vein here. I'll make it short, plug here. This is the second compartment occluded. And as a third step, the arterial vein was accessed, this one here in order to occlude the ventral part. And as fourth step, this posterior dorsal vein was accessed, allowing to cure the AVM. Okay. And this is just to see, this is just um, a video that I took three days after the last embolization, where you don't need to listen to the sound, but I, just want to show that he's not perfect. Of course, there's still some swelling and edema, but um, still the mobility is good. So similarly, once you start to consider this way to proceed, what to do here? This is an extensive AVM of the corpus callosum. He bled, this patient is 20, something between 25 and 30 years old. And we know from access to a corpus callosum AVM that uh, arteries usually don't do the job. But if you look at the veins, uh, Renee, we're still on, vein, on the video from the child. Lies. So that first step, the anterior compartment is being treated. Second step, the posterior but part. Sorry, sorry for interrupting. We, we still one until a cure can be obtained. Professor, we're still these large AVMs. This was three steps of transvenous. This is another two steps of transvenous. These AVMs are cured. This was a large one. Renee, I, guess, I don't know if you're hearing us, but the it's slides are not advancing. We did two steps of transvenous that we could get rid of it. And I can show different similar know. examples. I won't go into the details to show that in the end, um, for instance, this patient here. Um, required three steps of transarterial to reduce it, then three steps of transvenous. But when we finished his AVM, his mother called me and asked me, uh, is he allowed to do skateboard? <laughs> so I asked her, please send me the picture. So this is this patient here, once a cure was achieved, and uh, you see that obviously he was doing quite fine. Um, I would like now to maybe show a complication because not everything is easy and simple and um this is a patient here where i had the bleeding and the reason for this is um a lack of diffusion of the embolic agent and one quite important difference in the handling of transvenous in compared to transarterial embolization is that um in natural embolization, usually you try to get the microcatheter as distal as possible. In transvenous, it may be contraproductive. And look at this AVM here. This is a posterior circulation with a magnified view where I did not see that there were two veins. This is an early patient and I'm mostly focused on this one. And I did not recognize this as being a vein. I think that the type of imaging I just showed before is something that should be much more helpful to recognize it. So you see that the tip of the catheter was brought here. And when embolization has, was achieved, um, the cast of onyx does not match with the AVM. And whenever this is the case, there is obviously a problem. The cast of onyx should match with the cast, with the, the so-called nidus of the AVM. So some parts were not filled in. And the problem is the following. If there is a venous bifurcation, and if a microcaster is brought too distantly, uh, potentially adding a plug or not, but if you're too distal, 
you may diffuse from here back to arteries or continue to diffuse within the AVM, but the ability to go back and to diffuse from here is much restricted. And indeed, this patient had uh, some bleeding where can continue to go through this uh, situation where, um, uh, hold on, this is him, where you see that something is still remaining. So when something is remaining, you may try to go by the artery to further embolize which I did, but was not so successful. I could not get the whole thing. And even if it looks not too bad, obviously here some things are remaining. So I completely misunderstood the vein. And this lenticulose, um, no, this corridor artery from the PCOM is not accessible. And you see that this patient had, uh, um, he came already in for bleeding, but he had a major bleeding uh, some 24 hours later. Um, another situation with an AVM treated by transvenous embolization. Here is the AVM, here's the venous outflow. And at some point after transarterial embolization has been achieved, the size of the AVM has been reduced. Now venous success is being uh, done. And here's a plug in the vein to allow to push the embolic agent within the AVM, which is being achieved. And this is the aspect post-treatment. Post-treatment, the vein is not visible, but this here is remaining. And this is something that should not be here. And is this going to bleed? The answer is potentially yes. And if you have no further venous success, um, then you need to search for a solution which may be potentially very demanding. Here, uh, search with the magic. This artery was already a feeder that was occluded, but here's a tiny one where the only way to get access to it was to have the microcatheter in place and the balloon in front of it to seal the artery and then to push the embolic agent. So here I had no complication. I could occlude it, but this is the... Uh, uh, obviously a situation where the diffusion of embolic agent was not enough. So if it's not enough, either the patient must be operated or you must find a way. Um, the type of embolic agent which is used is certainly important. And from this point of view, um, the usual embolic agent today is onyx with a viscosity of 18. I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, Onyx 500 is not existing anymore for aneurysms. Onyx 34 is existing, 20 and 18. And as far as I know, most users take Onyx 18. Onyx 12 was not put on the market when it came out in 2006, because, no, a little before, because there's no possibility to obtain a plug with a higher dilution. But the advantage of a higher dilution that it's possible to diffuse much more within an AVM. So a very important point in the technique to allow a larger amount of diffusion of the embolic agent within the AVM is to use more diluted onyx. So onyx 18, uh, uh, 12, sorry, I'm uh, not sure it's on the market, but we have in Europe since several years Squid 12, and Squid 12 is much more able to penetrate all vessels, but the requirement for this is that a plug has been achieved. Uh, otherwise, if you did not plug before, then everything will reflux in the vein without um, uh, without uh, consolidating. So I will end here. Um, before showing the last slide on the conclusion, um, the complication rate of transvenous embolization in my experience is not higher and it's even lower than by transarterial embolization. I think the control of this is much higher. Now I'm at 580 transvenous embolization. So bleeding rate is something between five and 6%. Um, I don't think by transarterial embolization the bleeding rate is lower, it's rather a bit higher. 
And I think that the more we're working on it, the more it's possible to reduce this. So uh, which ABMs to start if you want to start with transvenous, definitely choose a small one, choose a deep location where all of the techniques will have difficulties, but not only because of this, because a deep located AVM is better to be accessed by the veins. The deep veins are the best one accessible, cortical veins from the superior sagittal sinus, from lateral sinus, and from and from um, or other veins joining cavernous sinus may be accessed, but the efforts are quite important to get there. Uh, don't forget to place a microcatheter in the artery to precisely understand your AVM, to see how much and define how much you want to occlude, and of course, to better see the vein of drainage. And before going on for venous treatment, you must control, which means clearly that two microcatheters must be placed, which means that an intermediate catheter usually cannot be used because then you won't be able to navigate with two venous catheters. And I will stop now. So I'm be happy to answer any question if there is any. Thank you so much, Professor, for this amazing lecture. Certainly mind changing uh, many concepts like the concept of nidus for me is really important how you describe the your conception of it and also you have shown that sometimes the impossible is possible with these cases so uh, if, if any of uh, of the attendees want to start with any comments uh, dr montiti is raising his hand uh, professor that was a fantastic talk and uh, we really all enjoyed it uh, with your vast experience uh, my question is um what proportion of cases do you do now transvenous compared to, say, transarterial? And um, uh, are any cases uh, sent for surgery now um, in your um, in your institution, or is everything done uh, endovascularly? So that's a very good point. Of course, surgery remains uh, and is, uh, I would say, the main and today the best treatment for AVMs. The ability to control all arteries is better if you see everything. If you need to watch through your microcatheter, it's very difficult. The problem is that surgery uh, can access, I mean, the more you get in the deep part, the more it's gonna be difficult. So what part is to do by what is completely open. We can imagine there are some situations where the deep part, we can treat preferentially the deep part of the AVM, remaining the cortical superficial part for surgery. And that, that's an important thing. When to consider transvenous, whenever you start to think of the veins as a potential access, always which means in each patient, we consider what would be the better way to access. Is it the artery? Is it the vein? And I would say today, each patient is considered for both systematically. So should we start to make an artery, then a vein, then an artery, or first three arterial feeders, then a vein? Uh, I leave it completely open. And indeed, veins allow a very good access, but the example I showed was a vein which is isolately to be identified. Let's say if an AVM is just like, a, is a venous segmentation, I just like the fingers of my hand, if the finger is very short, then you won't be able to make a plug to treat the corresponding part. So to treat the AVM by the veins, you need to be able to see them, to recognize that the vein has a segment which is long enough, but to, if you treat then by the vein, the ability to occlude all arteries arriving in this vein is much more important than if you go by the arteries, at some point reach the vein and then expect it, you will go back from the vein to the arteries whenever you make so-called intranidal injection, which is what it's all about. Thank you. Yeah, thanks again uh, so much for that presentation. You know, your your work is so elegant and meticulous. Um, I, I want to ask you kind of a philosophical question about the way forward uh, in this field for this technique, because I think there are very few people who can reach your level of uh, 
understanding and analysis. I, I'm, you know, you explain it very uh, clearly, but even so that segmenting the compartments and knowing when it's safe, for the example you just gave of taking the deep part of an AVM and leaving the superficial for surgery, that requires a level of sophistication that I, I, I don't think we can democratize. So I'm I'm wondering what you what your thoughts are about how we teach, share, and um, recommend AVMs be treated because you are you are a very busy guy and we can't send them all to you. Uh, it's a very good point. Um, I think we're at the beginning of this new era. I think that we considered that it was possible, but did not really dare to because we did not understand and um, had no tools that enabled us to understand. The more we look at the veins, the more we try to understand, the more we find some answers and have other questions that get open. But um, for instance, whenever we do a selective injection of each feeder, which we do before starting any AVM, which gives us a kind of map which are the different arteries to go there, which are the veins that go out. I used to look at the arteries to say, if I'm far or close to the shunts, whether I could embolize it, but I never looked at the veins as long as I did not consider to embolize them. <laughs> now that I consider the vein the same way, each time I look at one artery, I look at the same vein. If you look at in presentation that I made on AVMs, you always see, the arterial phase of the AVM, you never see the venous phase because we just don't focus so much on this. So I think starting to look at the vein and consider it is already opening the door. And um, the more we, we look at them, certainly we will <laughs> define many other techniques to see what it is, but definitely those rotational angiograms. I mean, 4D is a great technique too. I still don't know exactly how to integrate it in my workflow, <laughs> but it, I mean, it's great because it, it shows you the dynamic inside. Uh, the 3D we make with the fusion of those 3Ds uh, are done on a way that the entire vascular tree is filled. So it's a bit different way in doing the 3D than the 4D, which means, um, we need a lot of contrast agents to have the whole arteries and veins filled that you don't miss part of the branches. So this work and this analysis um, enables you to start to have an insight on what's going on. And then the more you look at it, the more you're considering that this is something. Look, we did even don't have dedicated material to do it. We use our regular catheters that are quite okay but we need dedicated material to get access to the cortical veins from the superior sinus. The reason is that there's a hook. I mean, there's always a U-turn and to make a U-turn is really tough. So um, is the bandit going to help because of the curve catheter, you can put a wire to an exchange or is it something else? Something like this will help. So um, understanding devices, all this is not ready. Changing the viscosity is, is really a major point. If it's less viscous, the chance to diffuse more is better, but at some point you pay the price of the advantage. If you have less viscosity, we may be able to over-inject the arteries. So now we start in some patients, for instance, those pericolosal AVMs, they have always billions of transmedullary arteries I mean, of, um, of opassant feeders that are too short to be controlled. So we place preventively a stent trever in those arteries. And it's quite frequent that we get some onyx back from the vein in the arteries that then we can retrieve because the material is in place. So how much to control <laughs> is what we need to define. But definitely it's expanding and... Um, uh, and especially for deep AVMs, I mean, they are more dangerous, but we have an access to those AVMs. So it's a message of hope, I would say. <laughs> I, I, that's a little different answer than what I was getting at. And I'm, I'm, I don't want to belabor it, but I just, mm -hmm. I think that in, in the majority of centers, the mix of how decisions are made, say gamma knife versus the small deep AVM, 
I, it's hard for me to imagine this level of ability being widely available. But I, I, I want I want to leave that, and I want to ask you a different question. You know, that, uh, sorry to 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 get further to your point because I progressively changed the <laughs> so, so, so topic. Um, I think it's important to train every day. <laughs> So uh, how to be able to train every day? <laughs> well, it's mm, you must find a way to work in a center where a lot of AVMs are being treated because indeed it requires a lot of efforts and a lot of dedication. <laughs> and I, yes, I, I think I think that's partly my point is 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 that this level of uh, skill really can only exist in a few places. Um, but the other next thing I wanted to ask was if if you had given any thought or are working with any um, research in perhaps something like two agent embol embolic materials. There are agents w there that can be triggered the precipitation by a second uh, in agent. Um, for example, injecting uh, algal from retrograde and calcium to polymerize it from the arterial side. Is that anything that, that you've uh, looked at or any research is, is going on with? I'm not aware of this, but it sounds a brilliant idea. So uh, I think any, uh, the fact to have onyx since 20 years uh, enabled to inject more liquid embolic, um, it was not always a good thing because there were terrible bleeding related to this because of excessive uh, embolization. Um, so onyx is okay, but it's not the end of the game. So definitely uh, any other uh, idea can only help. Right. And Matthias, do you have further questions from the chat? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, Professor, a few questions. Uh, first of all, just to to work a bit around, around the embolic materials that you use. You, you said that you use MBCA for the plaque and then you use onyx for the embolization, right? Yes. Okay. Another question is, uh, for how long can you afford to have the plaque on the venous side during the retrograde pressure cooking technique? You mentioned in a previous lecture that I that I had fortunately I watched that uh, that is not immediately. Obviously the AVN doesn't bleed immediately. But for how long do you think we can afford to have the venous plaque before we kill the AVM? Um, once the vein is occluded, there is no way back. Uh, how to help the liquid embolic to go inside the AVM and prevent the AVM to bleed? Uh, two things. Either you reduce the arterial flow mechanically by placing a balloon, or you reduce the blood pressure. Uh, placing a balloon is a good thing. Um, I stopped to do it, and I prefer to have my anesthesiologist helping me by reducing the blood pressure for different reasons. One is, as I stated, having a microcatheter in the artery is something important to control and understand. Um, second is, quite often, you have AVMs that are fed by different arteries. How many balloons do you want to have in how many arteries? And point three, I think that we're busy enough to work <laughs> when we're doing the AVM, and I'm happy to share some of the work and to have my anesthesiologist busy and to have the blood pressure down. So we bring the blood pressure to systolic 60, which is... Um, written in all handbooks of anesthesiology that this should not be done. <laughs> but of course, we don't do it for hours, which means at the point when everything is in place, then the plot pressure is lowered, then coiling is started. And whenever coils are being placed, you may see that before you start to inject your liquid embolic, there's already a thrombosis within those coils. And the first time I saw this, I was very much afraid because I thought that the patient was going to bleed immediately. And up to now, it did not occur. So probably because the blood pressure is reduced, but also because uh, you, at this time, start to embolize. And whenever thrombus is within the coils, finally, thrombus is also a plug. It's something that prevents 
the onyx to go downstream with the vein and enabled to go immediately inside the AVM. So precisely to your question, when does it start to bleed? The answer is, luckily, I don't know. But it does not bleed immediately. It's not uh, the vein is clipped, the AVM gets under pressure, and within the next seconds, it will bleed. Whenever treating, this is something that occurs progressively. And whenever the flow is reduced, then it's time to fill the whole veins uh, from the venous side. OK. Professor, how do, how do you mention, I mean, how do you define your bleeding rates after transvenous embolizations of AVMs? So, somewhere you mentioned something like 4.8% oh. over 370 cases. 5.8. Five, five, 5 um, um, this rate, uh, I was expecting this to reduce with time. <laughs> it does not. <laughs> um, but simultaneously, the um, challenges we're going on with treating uh, more difficult AVM is increasing. So I don't know how much relevant it is. I think at some point, we're not able to control each vessel. And in addition, keeping the patient under reduced blood pressure for several days is something that helps. Does it need to be an adrenal anesthesia? I don't think so. We don't do it. Maybe it would be helpful, but then for how long, I would not be able to say. So we reduce the blood pressure for the following five days uh, by 20 to what the blood pressure is usually keeping the patient quiet in hospital <laughs> so that we're sure that he doesn't do too much. And this seems to be something that helps. Um, this bleeding rate of uh, close to 6%, 5.8% includes a lot of AVMs that are great for a specimen of 4 and 5. So um, um, it's still a risk which is significant, which is the first thing I state to patients before considering treatment. But on the other hand, uh, our recruitment bias is that most AVMs don't remain silent the whole time. So if they are not treated because the patient is asymptomatic, that's fine. But at some point, problems are going to occur and they're starting to bleed or venous aneurysms are growing. And then you consider whether uh, whether something must be done. Okay. Professor, uh, regarding ruptured AVMs, fir first question is, how do you time your treatment after rupture? What is your timing? And second, if you consider transvenous and ruptured AVMs. So to the question of, is, is transvenous to be considered? The answer is yes. Uh, timing. Um, historically, I mean, the risk of re-bleeding of a rupture AVM, of acute re-bleeding is quite low. But we all know some patients where it happened because there's an obvious aneurysm to be seen. So I think doing an angiogram and more than an angiogram, which is placing a microcaster inside each artery to look precisely at it, uh, helps to see aneurysms that otherwise we would not see. Interestingly, in some situations, I'm thinking of brain uh, of, of AVMs, uh, let's say lateral pontine, lateral mesencephalic, that are fed by one perforator with a large aneurysm on top of it. Um, um, to get through the artery to kill the AVM is a good way to treat indeed the AVM and the aneurysm. But the consequences are devastating because usually there is also a brainstem infarction. Interestingly, the arterial aneurysm, whenever you go by the vein and shut down the AVM, and talking of small AVMs, of course, uh, allows the thrombosis of the aneurysm without having this ischemic complication. So this is here an important advantage. I don't have tons of those patients, but several where uh, I'm. I mean, up to now, I did not see a natural aneurysm responsible of bleeding that bled once the shunts were occluded by the veins. Okay. One last question, Professor. How do you integrate radio surgery in all this protocol? And do you try to give radio surgery before embolization or after? There's always a debate on, you know, most people prefer radio surgery before embolization to improve the. I mean, I've got a strong bias of thinking because I'm trying to push embolization as much as possible. But 
Uh, I think there is a place for anything and we have enough patients where no solution is brought. I think that the idea to start with radio surgery is a good one. And if we're facing a truly difficult AVM, it will be difficult, whatever we do. And if primary radio surgery enables to have it smaller, then it will make our life easier, both from an open surgical or endovascular perspective. Okay, there is one question from the audience. Uh, after transvenous embolization, if there is a small nidus remaining, what do you do with this in this scenario? I mean, there. Um, <laughs> the point is, this does not. You're not allowed to leave this. So that's why I showed the example where this should not occur. So uh, there are situations where we required immediate open surgery, which is in fact quite rare. Uh, we try to get it by the arteries at some point, and probably this is our answer that we mobilize from arterial side. Uh, taking into account some potential ischemia, but reducing the hemorrhagic risk. There's always a balance between both where you try to determine what is going to be more dangerous. Uh, should I continue? If I continue, I increase the risk of ischemia or um, should I do less? And then potentially there's a risk of bleeding. Okay. One more question from the audience from James Rabino. Uh, what are the long term, if the long term occlusion rates between transvenous and transarterial are better? Definitely. Um, the requirement for transarterial embolization to be curative is at some point you fill the vein. If the artery, if the vein is still open whenever you do a control, the chance to have something remaining is very high. Uh, we control, there are things, I mean, uh, the larger an AVM, the more you may see tiny little vessels around, and I don't really know what to do with those, uh, which is true for any technique. An AVM that looks occluded by radio surgery, whenever you put a microcaster, you may see some shunts. Uh, we see a lot of recurrences after surgery that were supposed to be complete, but still small things that remain that may be an issue. I think nobody of us knows exactly what it is, but indeed, the statement of having a cure requires a DSA after one year. And based on the first aspect, it's certainly underestimating the problems. Professor, <clears throat> a few more questions regarding outcomes. So uh, and I'm going to start the discussion with this. Uh, you published uh, a paper comparing the, your hybrid arterial and venous approach versus transvenous or transarterial alone, and you showed that occlusion rates with the hybrid approach are higher right so in the in the long run how, how would you define your long-term outcomes in angiographic cure and what, what are your rates of recurrence um whenever the avm is occluded by the veins chance for it to remain occluded is beyond 90 percent so okay. the are small things that may remain that may be seen where we wonder whether we should go on for treatment or not but when um, the AVM is occluded by the vein then let's say that 90 percent of um, the situation is is cured and settled okay and the, the same applies for your tra for, for your transarterial uh, protocol let's say you have angiographic cure with transarterial or with, trans, or with transvenous? You trust more the transvenous? You know what I mean? No, it's not that I trust more the transvenous. It's as long as the embolic agent did not reach the vein, uh, the vein will aspirate some arteries and some recurrence will be seen. Okay. Uh, I have no further questions. So, uh, Professor, thank you very much for this lecture. It was one of the best, really. I open you and thank you, Dr. Maldur, also for joining us and helping as usual. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Renee. It was it was terrific. I as I said at the beginning, I'm a big fan of your work and I really appreciate you uh, sharing it with us today. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you so much for your invitation. Thank bye you, bye. Professor.